Thank you all for joining another lecture for Interactive Computer Graphics. We're going to cover some interesting stuff today. It's going to be about transparency, blending, and alpha testing, and all that stuff that we're going to talk about today. Uh, that's going to sort of give us enough of a background to start talking about volume rendering next time. That's the plan. All right. So let's let's go ahead and start. Now, let's start with let's start with a question. Now look at this this sphere. See that, right? Would you call this a transparent sphere? Yeah, I don't know. A lot of people would probably call that a transparent sphere, right? Um, that is, mm, I'm going to say that's not a transparent sphere. Let me show you what a transparent sphere looks like. It looks like that. Well, not, not, not quite like this. It looks like this. <laughs> this is a transparent sphere. This, I think from purely language perspective, it would be okay to call that a transparent sphere. In fact, that would be accurate to call that a transparent sphere. But in the context of computer graphics, we, when we say something is transparent, this is what we mean. This has refractions, right? And these refractions are very different to compute. So we call something like this typically a refractive sphere, a refractive object. So this is a refractive object. This is a transparent object. So what's really the difference? I mean, visually, yeah, there are no refractions here. There are refractions there. So it's not like this has a refraction index that is the same as air. That's not the point. It's just when you look at a transparent object like this, you should imagine something that is that has holes like something that's porous that you can see through something something like this right you're, you're sort of seeing through but of course very very tiny holes that you're not seeing the holes but you're seeing whatever's behind it so you can imagine this as like see-through drapes right something like this like you can you can see through that's what we mean when we talk about transparency but of course there, there are refractions a lot of objects that we consider transparent in reality have refractions. Now, so today's topic is going to be mainly about transparency. That's what I said. But because these things, two things are related, I want to talk a little bit about refractions and how we could handle refractions. Because we talked about reflections. We didn't quite talk about refractions before. So let's, let's cover that. Refractions. All right. So... If refractions are real, <laughs> then they should be in the rendering equation, right? <laughs> That's, that has been our motto, right? So you look at the rendering equation, refractions should be here somewhere. I'm looking at it, and honestly, I'm not seeing them. I mean, that, they're really not there at all, right? So the thing is, if there are any refractions, the refractions are not going to come from anywhere above the surface, right? It's going to come below the surface from down here, right? So we can actually include refractions in the rendering equation. We just need to extend the rendering equation just a little bit, right? Instead of looking at a hemisphere, we're going to look at the entire sphere of all directions. So this becomes S square indicating the surface of the sphere. So we're going to look at all directions because light can be coming from anywhere. If it's coming from inside the surface, that's going to be a refraction, right? It's going to be refracted out and we'll, we'll see it through the camera. That's, that's the idea. And yeah, if it's coming from above the surface, that's going to be reflections. So yeah, okay. That's simple enough, right? And I changed this from FR, the reflection BRDF to fs, that is bsdf, that is scattering, bidirectional scattering distribution function, because refractions will be scattered, right? So it's not just reflections, but involves all sorts of surface scattering now. So this is the complete form of shading equation, all right? Rendering equation. Now, we're going to compute reflections and refractions a little bit differently, obviously. 
So we're going to do the same trick that we did before with, with everything. Like whenever we look at the rendering equation and say, I want to compute one part of it differently than another part of it, what, we do, what do we do? We take the rendering equation and we split it into pieces, right? So that's what we have been doing. We're going to do the same trick here. And the way we're going to split is, of course, we're going to look at this whole sphere and we're going to split the sphere into two hemispheres. So the top hemisphere and the bottom hemisphere, that kind of makes sense, right? So the top hemisphere is going to be the one that we've been looking at so far. It's, this, it's going to be the same thing. The bottom hemisphere is going to cover the refractions. So I can write my rendering equation as a sum of these two integrals. Top is the one that we had before. We just added this bottom one. That's the bottom half of the sphere. This is how I'm representing it. And it's otherwise the same equation. All good. Everything's good. Everything's fine. All right, so one more thing we're going to do. Remember when we were talking about reflections, we decided to look at perfect reflections. Instead of looking at all sorts of reflections off of the surface, because computing perfect reflections were a little bit easier because we had only one direction, right? So we assumed the surface was perfectly smooth. And when the surface was perfectly smooth, that sort of simplified the computation of reflections. Of course, not all materials are perfectly smooth, but this is for just making the computation easier. So we're going to do the same trick here. So I'm going to take this, take this BSDF and convert it to a delta BSDF. Okay, so this is going to be like a perfectly smooth surface with the refractions on it. So we know how to do the top part. Let's, let's get rid of it. I, I just, I'm just interested in this part. And that's going to be the, the light coming from the bottom hemisphere here. All right, so light is coming from everywhere, but I have this delta BSDF. That means I'm only, so this is going to be non-zero only for the perfect refraction direction. Only for the perfect refraction direction for my view direction, this is going to be non-zero. Otherwise, it's going to be zero because it's a delta BSDF because I'm assuming that the surface is perfectly smooth. In that case, I have this one direction that works, everything else, I can just throw them away. I don't need them. And the integral simplifies to this little thing. Very good, right? For a smooth surface, this is this is enough. And how do we compute this direction though? This refraction direction? Well, you must have seen how to do that using Snell's law. Like we're gonna look at the index of refraction outside. Let's assume that air is one. Not exactly one, but we can assume that it's one very close, actually. For index of refraction for glass is going to be, well, it depends on the type of glass, but it's, it's about 1.5. That's, that's reasonable. It changes depending on the material. So this is, one is for vacuum. It's good enough for air. And 1.5 is good enough for glass. So we can, we can use that. And you can just plug it into the Snell's law, and that can give you this refraction direction. I'm not going to tell you exactly how to compute it. It's actually fairly easy. It's a it's little more complicated than computing reflection directions, but not too complicated. It's fairly easy. In fact, in GLSL, it's actually trivial because there is a function <laughs> that, gives that gives that direction to you, just uh, called the refract function. And, and then it gives you this perfect refraction direction, and everything would be fine because we want to render perfect refractions, right? Because we're not interested in rendering anything else. Well, that's not true. <laughs> we are actually interested in rendering all sorts of objects. For example, if you have a perfect refraction, perfectly smooth surface, you get something like this, right? But if your surface is not perfectly smooth, then you would get different types of refractions off of that surface. So if you want to render something like this or that, yeah, that just delta B, delta B SDF is not going to be good enough. But these are a little, a little too complicated to handle, so let's not worry about them. Let's, let's worry about just this, this perfectly smooth surfaces, all right? So how am I going to compute refractions? Well, I can just compute the refraction direction. I just need to know the, the light that's, that's coming from, from behind the surface right now we can we can do exactly what we've been doing with 
reflections. I can just use a cube map that tells me the light coming from all directions, so I can find the directions coming from behind the surface as well, right? Time that that works. So I can I can do something like this. Just uh, here's my model, and with this uh, for every point that I'm shading, I'm looking at the refraction direction, and then you you look at your environment map, looking at cube map, and that tells you the amount of light that's that's coming over here, over the surface. Everything's good, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it looks like refractions. Things are refracted, kind of. It looks okay to me, but if I compare this to actually computing this using ray tracing, uh, that's not what I'm getting, right? I'm, I'm getting something a little bit different, quite a bit different, actually. Quite a bit different. Why, why is that? Well, here's the thing. Yes, with this, we, we are pendling the, the surface and refractions and everything is fine. But yeah, we didn't ref refract on the way out. So when we got into the surface, we didn't get out of the surface with another refraction. So we just passed through the back surface without changing the, the ray direction. That's not going to work so well. Like, this is actually doing proper refractions. This is just doing the refractions on the front surface only and completely ignoring the back surface. And that's, that's not going to be right. So normally, normally this, this view, view ray would refract into the object and then it would refract out, right? That's, that's what would happen. So, I need to somehow include the back surface. Now, Chris Weinman came up with this, this idea of image space refractions before we had ray tracing support on the GPU and we couldn't really trace these rays properly. That actually super fast work really well. But what they do is that they sort of ignore these multiple reflections going through. They just think about surface having a front the object having a front surface and one back surface, right? And that is really good enough for all sorts of practical purposes. It's, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good actually. Well, so when you, when you look at this example here, just the front surface, ray traced, and front and back. It's not exact, it's slightly different. And also it's not using ray tracing, so it's doing some image space approximation. So it's, it's not, the difference is not just coming from the fact that this multiple layers of surface is sort of ignored here. It's not just coming from that, but it's nonetheless pretty close, right? We just need to include the back surface. So how do we do that? Very simple idea, works really well. So here's our, let's say, model that we're trying to render. And when we are rendering this, of course, we know the surface position at any point, right? At any point, I can, yeah, I know the depth values. I, I know the surface normal. So I can do the, find the refraction direction easily. So surface, front surface refraction, that's easy. I already have all this information that I need in my shader. I can do that. That part is easy. Now, the question is, how am I going to refract this from the back surface? For that, I kind of need to have access to that back surface in my shader. That, that's what I need. So what we're going to do is that we're going to be doing a pre-render pass. We're going to render the back side of our object, just the back side from the same view, from the same view here. We're going to render the back side. And that backside is going to give me the depth of the backside and the, the surface normal at the backside. Because once I find my position at the back, I need to refract off of that. So I need to know the surface normal there as well. How am I going to use this? Well, here's how one way to do that. There are slightly different ways of doing this, but I'm going to give you the simplest one. For any point here that I'm trying to shade, like any point on the surface that I'm trying to shade, I know the depth value here because, well, that's my fragment shader. I know the depth value there. Now I'm going to look up. I'm going to look up the depth value exactly at the same point for the back surface. Now I have this because I rendered this before I rendered rendered the front surface, right? So I have this as a texture. 
So this difference between the depth value here and the depth value there will tell me the thickness of the object, how far I'm going to expect the ray to travel inside that object. All right. So the refracted ray will travel inside the object. And this is going to give me an approximation of what the thickness of the object is. It's going to give me exactly the thickness for that point. And it's going to give me an approximation of how long the ray will travel inside the object. All right. And I'm going to use that approximation. So after I refract the ray using my surface normal, I'm going to use that approximation of how far I expect the, the ray to travel to, to find out where I'm going to be on the back surface. All right. If I were to travel this much, which pixel would I end up? Fairly easy to compute, actually. Um, so in camera space, you can do that computation and figure out if I were to travel in this refracted ray direction this much, depend based on the difference between these two depth values, then you end up at a different pixel. At that different pixel, you, you look at the surface normal and you do your outgoing refraction. All right. And once you have your outgoing refraction, you know the outgoing refraction direction and you can have this nice looking refractions here. Right, so that's that's the idea. Works brilliantly, super fast, actually, uh, quite quite a bit faster than doing ray tracing. So uh, works really well in practice. E everything's good, except that <laughs> here's the thing: after I refract from the back surface, then what? I mean, yeah, if I have just an environment map, it's it's good enough. Yeah, that's going to work, but what if I have other objects in the scene? What do I do? Am I not going to refract the other objects? Uh, but remember, the similar thing happened to us when we were talking about reflections. If we had an environment map, we could reflect the things at the environment. But the reflections of other objects was a little bit of a problem. And for that, we talked about maybe computing custom custom environment maps or reflection maps per object, like you do put a cube map at the center and compute all directions. And that was really necessary for computing reflections because when you look at reflections on a surface, you see all of the directions. Refractions, not always like this. They, they often show what's behind the object. They don't really show all directions. They show what's, what's behind oftentimes. They can show what's, they can show in all directions, but they kind of need to have some crazy refractions for that to happen. Typically, what you see is the backside of the object. So, um, Chris Wyman had an, an extension to this right afterwards, talking about a fairly simple method for computing the refractions of other objects in the scene. So, I'm not going to get into the details of how this works, but, but just to give you the gist of how it works, basically, you, you render your whatever is behind the object first, and you put in that, let's say, your, your texture map. And then when you're, when you're finding this, this outgoing refraction direction, so this is your, your image for whatever's behind the object, and this is the representation of whatever actually is behind the object. So this is the image that you render. You place it at a particular distance. A and then you sort of go step by step and, and figure out where you might have found the refraction. So this is sort of reminiscent of very similar to a parallax mapping that we talked about before. So it's using a, a, a similar idea here to sort of approximate the, the refractions. And they actually work pretty well. You can see the refractions of other objects and it looks plausible. And that's, that's the point, right? All right, that's enough about refractions. That, that's not even our main topic. So let's, let's move on to our main topic. We're not talking about refractions because oftentimes yeah, refractions. Okay, good. But I'm rendering an object. And the kind of refractions that I'm going to be mostly dealing with in a typical scene is going to be refractions through windows. Yeah, there are refractions through windows. <laughs> these are not like transparent objects, as I told you before. Right? These are actual refractions. At the same time, they kind of look like transparent surfaces, right? Why is that? I mean, it doesn't look like I'm seeing any kind of weird deformations. I would see weird deformations if this class was 
not really flat, but oftentimes glass is going to be flat and it's going to be relatively thin, right? Because it's thin and it's flat, uh, the incoming ray that hits this glass is going to refract and refract back from the backside, going exactly in the same direction. So what happened here is that within inside the glass, your your uh, refraction rate moves the the view direction just a just a little bit, just a, just a little bit, depending on if you're looking at head on, it won't move at all. But if you're looking at it from from a, from a weird direction, then it's going to just shift it just a little bit. That's that's an effect that's very easy to ignore, it really doesn't do much. So for practical purposes, it doesn't make sense to treat glass windows like this by using, by computing refractions, because refraction computation is sort of complicated and also error prone, right? So we're not going to get exactly what we want. I mean, it might look okay for complicated objects. For, for glass panel like this, eh, it's, it's not going to be good enough. But we don't really need to do all that complicated stuff. We can just render some, some transparent object, right? So we can just render some transparent object. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to be completely see-through, so probably it's going to have some color, maybe some shading. Maybe I, I'm going to see some specular highlights on the glass. The specular highlights on glass are actually quite visible depending on the lighting direction. So, um, or it could have some, some tint to it. So I want to render a a transparent object for representing glass windows like this. So this is the kind of thing that we would like to be able to handle using transparency, right? You see, like transparency and refraction are very, very closely related, but it's, it's just uh, different ways of computing things. All right, so we're going to have to do transparency here because that's going to be a lot more efficient. But before we can talk about that, we need to talk about this concept of blending. All right, we need to first talk about blending. All right, so what is that? So here's the idea. Alpha blending specifically. I have this object, very simple object. It's just a square, all right? <laughs> it's just a blue square. I have this opaque blue square. And on top of that, I'm going to draw at some transparent object let's say another square, this time a red square. Now, obviously, because this is transparent, I'm going to be seeing through this, this blue square behind it. The question is, how am I going to compute the color here? That, that's the question. And that's going to be done using alpha blending. Now, this term alpha, we've been using alpha, right? R, G, B, A, A being alpha. This alpha represents transparency and we can use it for rasterization and we can use it for doing alpha blending. Now let's imagine that my object at the back has some background color. Let's call it CB. All right, so that's the color of the background object. And its, it's alpha is going to be one. That means it's fully opaque. Okay. My object in the front has some other color and has some alpha value that is not one. It's less than one, so I can see through it. The way I'm going to compute this is that, imagine this. If this alpha was one, then I would only see this color CF, right? And nothing else. I wouldn't see the like white background here. I wouldn't see the blue object here. I would just see this color F, CF right? If this was completely opaque. Now, if this was zero, I would just see what was in the background. I wouldn't see any of this color. So how much of this color I, I see depends on this alpha. So basically, I need to multiply this color with this alpha, right? That's going to tell me how much of this color I will be seeing. How much of the, the background will I be seeing? Either the background color or the background objects. I'm going to see the background objects depending on the amount of the background object I will see. It will depend on this, this alpha value. So if this alpha is 1, I'm going to see none of it, right? It's going to be, I'll, I'll see 0. 
if this alpha is zero, then I'm going to see all of it. Then I'm going to see one, like the whole background. So basically, what I see in the background is one minus this alpha. Right? Whatever is remaining. So imagine that this object is sort of, it has some por holes. It's a porous object. It has some holes. And wherever there are holes, I'm going to see in the background. I'm going to be seeing the background. Wherever there are no holes, I'm going to be seeing the foreground color. So this alpha blended color can be written as this formula. I just multiply the foreground color with alpha, multiply the background color with 1 minus alpha. Right? So this is how we do alpha blending. Now, can I do alpha blending on the GPU? Absolutely. Where am I going to do it? Uh, well, you can just think that return an alpha value that is not 1 and GPU will automatically do alpha blending. Not quite, but close. Close. Remember when we were talking about the GPU pipeline? We had this thing here. Remember this guy? We didn't quite talk about it before. Is that uh, some, some blending? Yeah, this is actually exactly what handles this, this blending operation. So after, you, after your fragment shader outputs the color with some alpha value, here blending happens and, and the blended color is written to the frame buffer, right? That's where, that's where it all happens. Magic, blending. All right, so how do we, how do, we do this? Fairly easy. We just tell the, the API should just tell the GPU to enable blending. That's it. So <laughs> turn on blending and you're pretty much there. You also need to tell what kind of blending we're supposed to do. So if you want to do proper alpha blending, that would be multiply the foreground color with alpha and multiply the background color, whatever is already there, with one minus alpha. All right. So this is going to tell the GPU how to do blending. Well, there are we have this function because we can do all sorts of different types of blending. I'm not planning to get into different types of blending in, in this lecture, but there, there are different ways of blending that, that you could use for all sorts of different purposes. Alpha blending is what we use for transparency, but you may want to do other types of for all sorts of other effects. Uh, you, can, you may want to add two images together or you may want to subtract one from the other. You can, you can do all sorts of different types of blending. For example, over here, the color value that I'm outputting from my fragment shader might already be multiplied by the alpha. If it's already multiplied by the alpha, this, I should not multiply by alpha. I should just say it's one because it's, going to be, it's already multiplied by the alpha, right? Uh, so there are a whole bunch of ways of configuring what the foreground color and what the background color is supposed to be multiplied with. Actually, there's extensions that allow you to uh, modify the, the alpha values and blend the alpha values differently as well. Uh, so combining different buffers. But there are basically my whole point in showing you this slide is that there are whole bunch of ways of configuring how blending should happen on the GPU. But what we're typically interested in is this alpha blending, right? So with this, now we're ready to talk about transparency. All right, finally we're there. Okay, that didn't take long, right? All right, let's start talking about transparency, finally. All right, so it's, it's very easy, right? I just turn on turn on alpha blending and I output alpha values from my fragment shaders and it's done, right? You just turn on blending, just GL enable blending and then I say I want to do alpha blending and then you, you render your object and you get, see, that's a see-through object and I'm not nice transparency, I'm seeing the object behind it, I'm seeing the object behind this, wait, what's happening here? Oh, I'm, I'm missing the object behind that here. This is supposed to be transparent. What is happening here? Like, I, this is obviously transparent. Otherwise, I wouldn't see this box behind it. But in this case, I'm not seeing this other thing. Be, like, what is going on here? 
Ah, now here's a sad, sad truth about rasterization. We talked about this way back when we were first talking about rasterization. You'll remember. Rasterization is great for handling opaque objects. Z-buffer rasterization, specifically. But Z-buffer rasterization is not equipped to handle transparency. Remember we talked about painter's algorithm? The painter's algorithm for, for rendering? So you render from back to front. That's what we were doing for with the painter's algorithm. With Z-buffer rasterization, we didn't need that, but we need that for transparent objects. If we have transparency, yeah, if we have semi-transparent objects, we're going to have to render them from back to front. There are other rasterization-based algorithms, such as A-buffer rasterization, that does not have this problem because a buffer rasterization would automatically sort the the fragments before everything is blended together but with z buffer rasterization we don't have that so if you don't render things from back to front you're going to have this problem so in this case <laughs> uh, obviously this object was rendered first and then this one and the depth test sort of said hey you're not visible here there was another object that already corrupted the depth value. So this object could not generate any fragments over here because Z-buffer rasterization cannot know that there was some transparency behind it. Like there, there's no way of knowing that properly or handling that properly. So here's what, what we're going to do. We're going to reorder everything, all right? We're going to order all of our transparent objects. We're going to render them based on that order. So the way that this is typically handled is that we first First, render all of the opaque objects. All of the opaque objects. And I don't care about their rendering order too much. It's, it's okay. I, either way, I'm going to get the correct result with Z-buffer rasterization. But when it comes to rendering the transparent objects, I'm going to render them from back to front. And when I render them from back to front, here's what happens. All right? So from back to front, when I render them in that order, now I'm getting the correct, correct transparency. Now I can do proper alpha blending, right? This is, this is using alpha blending and, and I'm getting the correct result. So that's the thing. I'm rendering this object from back to front, it's my objects from back to front, and it's, it's working just fine. If I'm rendering, that is, if I'm rendering separate objects. So I have a transparent object and another transparent object in front of it. But what if I am rendering one object that's not flat like this, it has a front surface and a back surface? How am I going to handle that case? Like a teapot, right? A teapot that I'm and I'm rendering, and what happened? I just lost the back surface of the teapot here. The teapot was transparent. I'm getting some transparency because I can sort of order things, but I'm not getting all of the transparency because I can't. I mean, it's kind of hard to order the triangles of one object, like triangles of the teapot. I need to order them based on the view direction. I need to order the triangles. Now imagine that you have this, this buffer where you have all of your vertex indices and based on your view direction, you have to order that buffer. Isn't that fun? Yeah, it's not fun at all, right? It's, you really don't want to do that. It's super expensive. Um, okay, there are more expensive things to do that you could do, but it's, it's still very, very expensive just to reorder all of your indices. And if you're not using indices, then you reorder all of your vertex attributes. That, that would be horrible. Um, so here's the thing. So what I want is this concept that's called order-independent transparency. So I would like to be able to get an image that looks like this regardless of which order I render my triangles. So that's the concept of order independent transparency. Of course, the solution is don't use Z buffer, just use A buffer. <laughs> that's. <laughs> well, GPUs do Z buffer. So 
Uh, we kind of stuck with that. Uh, we can't quite, quite do <clears throat> anything. Well, we we kind of have to use Z buffer. So, but there are ways to use the Z buffer rendering provided by the GPU and make it kind of act like a buffer, or make it kind of act like. Uh, an, an algorithm that sort of sorts the, the parts of the objects. Now, one way of handling order independent transparency is this concept of what's called depth peeling. Depth peeling. Here's how it works. <clears throat> now, I'm going to be rendering this, this image in layers, in multiple layers. The first layer is going to be the image that I'm seeing. So I render the image that I'm seeing, but I don't have any transparency. All right? So this is like the opposite of doing sort of back to front order. This is like ordering from front to back, but I'm not ordering any, any triangles. All right? I'm just rendering my entire scene, assuming that everything is perfectly, perfectly opaque. Okay? And if I do that, I get this image. I rendered my entire scene, in this case, it's just a teapot. <laughs> I render my, my teapot, well, actually, there's a, there's a plane behind it. I rendered it, assuming that it's opaque. But it isn't. I know that it isn't. I'll, I will be able to see what's, what's behind it. So what I'm going to do next is that I am going to render the same scene again. But this time, this time, I'm going to peel the depth layer. So I have a depth buffer here, but right? I rendered this image. It gave me a depth buffer. I am going to be using this depth buffer for doing additional depth tests, for doing an additional depth test while rendering this one, the second layer. So if I do that, then I'm going to have two depth tests, two, two Z buffers, one Z buffer that's while I'm, I'm rendering, the other Z buffer that comes from the previous render. Okay? And using this Z buffer, well, I'm going to use this Z buffer in the opposite direction. So anything that is equal to or closer to the camera, well, equal to or closer to the camera, will be peeled. I'll, I'll just uh, ignore those fragments. So if I do that, all of these fragments that I could see in the first layer will fail the depth test, right? Because they will be exactly at the same depth value that they were before. <laughs> so they will all be culled. That means they will be peeled. So I will see whatever is behind it, whatever is immediately behind it, like the first layer after, after the first layer. Well, that means the second layer. <laughs> so I'm going to be seeing the second layer. All right. Now I'm going to do the same for rendering this. Now I'm going to be using the de depth value of this, I, I get, the, get the next layer. As you can see here, the teapot looks blue because this is not the teapot. This is the, the part of the plane behind it. I right, have a blue plane behind it, so this is the part of that plane. And the next layer, here you're seeing more of that stuff. So how many layers do I need? Well, it depends. Depends on what kind of image I'm rendering. So with just one layer, I get this. With just combining two layers, I get this. So of course, we're going to combine them using alpha blending in the end. But the alpha blending will work in the opposite direction. So not from back to front, but from front to back. Turns out you can do that as well. It doesn't save you anything. So it's still the same computation. You just need to flip the order of, of computation. You can do alpha blending from front to back or back to front. Back to front is more common because it's more suitable for Z buffer rasterization, but from front to back is perfectly okay as well. That's what depth peeling is going to do. It becomes the same equation. Okay, equation is modified slightly because you're doing it from front to back, but you can, you can do it. Still, it doesn't save you much because you still need to order. <laughs> either back to front or front to back order, it really doesn't help you. Anyhow, so one layer gives you this, the two layers, I'm seeing, I'm starting to see what's, what's behind it. I'm starting to see the second layer, right? With three layers, I'm starting to see the third layer. With four layers, I'm starting to see the fourth layer. How many layers am I going to get? Well, that depends on how many layers I have in my scene, right? Probably in this scene, 
four was sort of okay. Maybe there's fifth for a few layer is needed for a few pixels. Maybe not. But I can I can do something like this. So the the nice thing here is that I got complete order independent transparency. Yay! So that was good. Order independent. I didn't have to order any of the triangles. I didn't have to order any of the objects. It just you just render. But but I had to render the same scene four times. That means my render time is multiplied by four. <laughs> so if I could get, let's say, 60 frames per second in a scene, and I start doing this with four layers only, I'm getting, what, 15 frames per second. Yeah, not so great, right? <laughs> So that's, there's an additional cost. And it's just four layers. You may need way more than four. And in some, especially for some visualizations, you will need a lot more than four. So this is not going to quite cut it. It's going to be a little slow, um, especially if you're rendering some, something that, that's expensive to render. What we want is that we would like to have order independent transparency to render an image like this and we would like to get it using single pass maybe just two passes <laughs> and it is doable now it this is going to be a software implementation of the a buffer algorithm in in a z buffer render <laughs> so basically what we're going to have to do is that we're going to have to get all these fragments and then we sort them, and then we record them in a sorted way. So how do we do this? Well, there are different ways of doing this. These are different approaches of doing exactly the same thing. I'm going to have to store all of the layers. But, but what I would like to do is that I would like to render my scene once. I'm going to have to store all of the layers, yes, while I'm rendering. Because if I don't store all of the layers, then I cannot do proper alpha blending. So I need to store all of the layers per pixel. And then in order, I need to do alpha blending. All right? That alpha blending has to happen in order. So I'm not going to be rendering into a single output frame buffer. I'm going to be rendering into multiple buffers or a buffer that can hold multiple color values per pixel, um, RGBA color values per pixel. And there are different ways of doing this. Like I could just say, oh, I'm only going to pick the first K fragments and I'm going to ignore the rest. Very much like depth peeling. But, but you know, every time you have a new fragment, you kind of need to go and check some buffer and see, oh, what fragments I had for that pixel before. And then you read those fragments, reorder them, and then you, you store. Um, you can get away with without, without reordering you just need to store all of them and then at some point you're going to have to reorder them. So I'm not going to get into the, the details of, of these methods, uh, but I just want you to know that this exists. It's possible using OpenGL with some, some atomic operations or, or spin lock or just storing a linked list. Uh, you can actually do this ordered independent transparency with a single render pass and it's obviously going to be a lot more complicated. If you're interested in finding out the details, um, the reference is here. This talk actually talks about the, the details of all these. Some of them are a little bit faster than the others, depending on, the, on your scene. But that's, that's the idea. Basically, this is a way of doing what the A buffer rasterization algorithm does on the GPU. That actually does Z buffer, and you kind of need to do the A buffer kind of reordering in software yourself. So that's, that's the idea. And if you do that, you can get some super nice looking images with a single pass like this, right? That's, it's looking, looking pretty good, if you ask me. Although, yeah, these are just, these are just transparent. Uh, you know, when I look at chess pieces like this, I would expect, like, I would expect them to have some refractions, right? Okay. so. Maybe you find this image really nice. I, I like it a lot, but maybe maybe you don't find it very compelling because you wanted to see refractions and there are no refractions because we're doing transparency. We're not doing refractions, right? But I can show you another another image that is 
a, a compelling use case for this that is rendering really thin objects like hair. So this is doing proper order independent transparency and this is just doing, I, I believe this is just doing uh, alpha blending without ordering. So without ordering alpha blending, you don't get the right results. Why is that? Because here's the thing, hair strands, yeah, light can go through them and light sort of refracts through them quite a bit. So maybe you should think about them as sort of refractive things. But more important than what light does to hair for this sort of problem is that hair is really thin. Hair strands are super thin. So if I'm drawing a hair strand, uh, well, probably it's going to be very thin as compared to the size of a pixel in a lot of cases. Right? And if it is much thinner than the size of a pixel, then what are the chances that a hair strand will intersect with the sample of that pixel, at the center of that pixel? If it's not passing through the center, I'm going to just ignore it. That is really bad. So view, that looks really awful. You want to have proper anti-aliasing with hair. And for that, what we typically do, this typical trick for rendering such thin objects is that instead of rendering them so thin, we render them thicker, as thick as a pixel, but then we make them transparent, right? So you say, okay, you're, you're thick now, so you're like covering the entire pixel, but you were supposed to cover it just a portion of the pixel. So you're covering the whole pixel now, but I'm going to reduce your transparency so you'll look like what you're supposed to look like. All right, so you take the hair strands, you make them thicker, but you make them transparent. That's the idea. So if you make the hair, hair strands thicker, but transparent, then you have the order independent transparency problem. Like you just alpha blending is not going to give you the right result. So you kind of need to do order independent transparency for objects like this. And yeah, I, I think it's a compelling use case of order independent transparency. So back in the day, I faced with this problem, but the trick I used was a little bit different. Now, this is a total trick. This is not proper order independent transparency that I'm going to show you. Here's, it. Here's how it goes. So let's say I'm trying to render a hair model like this, but, but this is not exactly the hair model that I'm rendering. Here's a trick. These hair models look the same, right? You look at them, do you see a difference? They're actually not the same at all. So here's how, how these images are rendered. I took the, all of the hair strands of this model and I split them into three groups. Right? The first group, second group, third group. They're coming from the same hair model, they're just different hair strands. Right? And I'm rendering them into three different images. Three different separate images and I'm rendering them as completely opaque. They're not transparent at all. And if they're not transparent, I don't have any problems, right? If they're not transparent, that sort of solves all of my problems. Z-buffer rationalization just works, just works fine. So I'm rendering them as opaque objects in, in three different buffers, and then, and then I'm combining them. How? Just Take the average color. <laughs> this is a, a trick. So it is not a substitute for transparency or order independent transparency, but for this particular application, it works just fine. Because the thing is, yeah, I have three hair strands. Let me go back. I have three hair strands for each fragment. I have a hair strand coming from this, another hair strand coming from this, another hair strand coming from this. Now, if I were to render this properly, I need to do order... Well, I need to do some ordering and then do alpha blending, right? So, I, I kind of need to figure out which one is in front, which one is in back, and I can do that. But we, can, we can just render them separately and then, and then blend them. And that would be similar to what the A buffer... Uh, A buffer rasterization approximations are, are doing. So, but what I did was just um, 
take the average of all three. So I don't know which hair strand is in front, which hair strand is in the back, and I'm totally ignoring the, the Z buffers. It's just blending them all together. And in this case, yeah, the order of hair strands are wrong. Yeah, some hair strands are supposed to be in front of others, but they're not. They're just sort of blended together. But the thing is, you can't tell. <laughs> and they're kind of too small to, to tell. Uh, but if I show you just rendering, rendering here as opaque, as, as opaque fragments versus this trick, you see that you know this, this is looking a little too um, too thick, and so and and this this is looking like more 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 proper like thin hair strands. Of course, this is just using three layers. You could, you could do more, but yeah, that's a that's a trick that I used back in the day, so I wouldn't have to worry about this transparency problem when I was rendering hair. Anyhow, enough about hair rendering. Let's let's move on to other things. We're going to talk about hair rendering just a little bit, but. We're going to get back to a little bit of that, but I want to conclude with talking about this very important concept that is alpha testing. Very, very important concept for interactive rendering. So here's what we're trying to accomplish. I want to render an object like this, let's say. Grass blades. I, so how many triangles do, I have, do you think I have here? I probably have quite a few, right? If I were to model this, I would have, I would end up with lots of, lots of triangles. Um, guess what? In an open field, <laughs> an open field of grass. Can I render something like this? Probably not, right? That would be a ridiculous amount. I mean, the, the number of triangles I would need is sort of ridiculous. I can't do that. But. We do do that. Uh, we we do handle scenes like this, like that contain a sort of tall grass, for example. Like how do we how do we even handle that? Here's how: alpha testing. That's the trick. So I'm gonna instead of modeling this, I'm gonna do a trick. I'm gonna do a trick. I'm gonna I'm gonna take this as an image. I'm gonna take a photo of this and and maybe paint the the alpha values so I know what part of this is supposed to be transparent, what parts of it is supposed to be opaque. And then I'm going to put this on some flat planes like this. Now, here's a, here's a trick that's coming in, the alpha testing trick. Now, when I'm rendering this, I'm not going to render them like this because this is not what I want to get, right? I'm going to do what's called an alpha test. That is, for each fragment, if its alpha value is less than 0.5, if it's less than half, I'm going to throw it away. I'm just going to throw it away. If it's greater than half, <laughs> I'm going to keep it. So alpha values between 0 and 1, I put a threshold right in the middle and say if it's anything that's less than the threshold, I'm going to throw it away. If it's greater than the threshold, I'm going to keep it. If I do that, this image turns to this. Isn't that amazing? It's like I have all this detailed geometry and I absolutely don't. So what do I do? I just threw away some fragments. Now there are two ways of doing this. GPUs have alpha testing support. You can, in, in the API, you can say, turn on alpha testing, set whatever threshold that you want, and GPU will do alpha testing for you at, during the blending phase. So you just uh, output whatever alpha value that you want from your fragment shader and GPU will do the alpha testing for you. That's one way of doing that. The other way of doing this is doing it in software in your fragment shader. Fairly easy. You can just say if the alpha value is below whatever threshold you want, or however, however you want to decide whether or not to keep a fragment in the fragment shader, you just call discard and it discards the fragment. Right? So that fragment will never be used. So that's another way of doing that. You can actually do this in software. You're not necessarily bound to what the hardware is capable of doing for you or the, the API is offering for you. So you can do things like this fairly easily, right? You just set a threshold and then you have all this detail. And that, that works brilliantly, actually. So here's an, here's an example that I really like. Uh, so this is doing alpha blending and this is doing alpha test. This is looking nicer and smoother. This is not, this is looking a little jaggedy, pixelated. 
But other than that, they look pretty similar, except that this is wrong. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can tell that it's wrong, but if you pay attention, so this, this, these leaves that are supposed to be in the front, they're at the back here. They're not in the front. You see that they're sort of being occluded, occluded over here. It's, it's because this is doing, yes, alpha blending, but it's not ordering anything. <laughs> It's doing alpha blending without the order, so you get the wrong result, right? So, uh, but if you do alpha testing, I mean, every, every fragment is going to be opaque, right? This is not doing, this is not doing all order independent transparency or anything. It's just uh, every fragment is either discarded or kept. If it's kept, if it it's it's going to be opaque. If it's discarded, it's gone. So there's no blending, but because of that, there's going to be a, because there's going to be a, a threshold. Things are going to be sort of pixelated. It, you're not going to get nice soft edges that you would get with alpha blending because our alpha values are either zero or one with alpha test. Okay, the output alpha value is going to be clamped to either, either zero and one. And the geometry for rendering either one of these looks like this. Right. So okay, there are quite a few triangles here. It's not just one triangle, but still a lot fewer triangles than what you need for actually modeling an object like this, right? Still, when you look at it, it's, it's a lot fewer triangles than what you would need for this. So it's, it's pretty good. But if you look at the details, you see the details here? It's, it's a little sort of pixelated. Yeah, so it doesn't quite look like what you get with alpha blending. But alpha blending was wrong, so, <laughs> so we're good. But we can do a little bit better. So here's the thing. The reason why we're getting this, this pixelated stuff is that be, we're not using any anti-aliasing, right? Because without any anti-aliasing, I have this, this one, one sample at the center of each one of my pixels. And if, that, if there's a triangle that intersects with it, then I'm going to say that that's visible. If not, it's not visible. So it's the same idea. But instead, of, instead, imagine that I'm not rendering this one triangle, but instead I'm rendering this, this plane that contains a triangle image on it. All right, so I'm not rendering this triangle, but I have an image of a triangle on a plane. So I'm going to be sampling this image, and if my sample position, which is at the pixel center here, if that corresponds to the part that's, that's opaque, then I'm seeing it. Right? If it corresponds to something that's, that's transparent, that means I'm not seeing it. So this pixel is going to be either fully covered or not covered at all. But with alpha to coverage, we can, we can do alpha to coverage is this, this concept. We can use something like MSAA. With MSAA, let's say 4x MSAA, I have four pixel samples. What alpha to coverage is going to do is that instead of doing MSAA, this is going to do some sort of alpha testing, but instead of saying the pixel is fully covered or not covered at all, the alpha value will determine what portion, what percentage of the samples are covered. So more specifically, the GPU will pick some of the samples here, let's say out of four, based on your alpha value, it's going to pick some of the samples my alpha value was 0 0.3. It means it's greater than 0 0.25. That means one of these, one of these four MSAA samples will be covered. Okay, the other ones will not be covered. And G GPU will use a predefined pattern to pick that. And that can be different for, for each pixel. So the this, this alpha to coverage is this concept that supported by the graphics API and the GPU. You can just turn it on and say, hey, I want to use alpha to coverage with however many X samples that you want. And you get much softer looking edges like this. So basically this is adding different levels of alpha values. So instead of alpha values being zero or one, like with, with regular alpha testing, and, and which would give you these really jaggedy edges, 
you get sort of smoother edges because now I have alpha values that could be 0, 0, point, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, or 1. Right? So I have, with 4x, I have uh, this much different values. And I don't need to worry about, I don't need to worry about order independent transparency or anything because this is just using the subpixel samples of, that are available for MSAA, multi-sample anti-aliasing. So GPU can actually figure out which one is, uh, which one is covers which one's in front automatically for me. I won't have to worry about that, right? So I don't have to worry about order independent transparency. Everything is still rendered as opaque, but opaque at the sub-pixel level, right? For a sub-pixel fragment. So that's, that's how it works. And with that alpha testing, it's actually uh, alpha testing and alpha to coverage. They're, they're used for all sorts of things. You could, you could use it for, like, like grass blades, you could use them for, for hair and facial hair, also beard and or grass blades. Or you could have fences that see through fences. So, so these sort of things are rendered using alpha testing. Or I have a really complicated object, like a, like a tree. I'm not going to model each one of the leaves here? No. I can just use this as a texture. So I don't have to at least... Well, okay, there are, there's at least one triangle for each leaf here. So this is not a very cheap model. But at least I don't have to worry about modeling individual leaf shapes, right? <laughs> they are there. So this is even used for offline rendering. It's a trick that's even used for offline rendering because that sort of saves you a lot of triangles. And definitely used for interactive rendering. The problem, the problem, the last thing I'm going to talk about is the problem with this. If I'm rendering this object from this distance, it's okay. But if, my, if I move my camera away, and now I'm seeing this object at a distance, this is what you expect to see, right? But what you end up seeing is this. <laughs> what? Where did all my leaves go? They, they just disappeared. Here's what happened. Now. I, this is happening because I'm using MIP mapping. And I have to use MIP mapping. If I don't use MIP mapping, this, this starts dancing like crazy. It's, it's really bad. I have to use MIP mapping. We talked about MIP mapping. It's important, right? Texture filtering, very important. But if I use MIP mapping for my texture that's going to be used for alpha testing, here's what happens to my MIP levels. At some point, they converge into a single color, and that single color may be below my alpha threshold. And if it is below my alpha threshold, all the leaves are gone, <laughs> right? It's all gone. And, and yeah, if in higher mipmap levels, parts of things will be gone. Maybe not all of it, but parts of it will be gone. At some point, everything will disappear. So, for example, if I use it for a character like this, at a certain distance, <laughs> well, I just shaved his beard. <laughs> unintentionally, right? So this is definitely not something that that, that we want. Right? This is really not robust, right? So this has been an ongoing problem uh, and very practical problem. Actually, there are games that shipped with this problem. So you, 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 can, you can notice it in some of the older games, definitely. Uh, I'm hoping that some of the newer games are using more recent techniques, such as hashed alpha testing that's Chris Wyman and Morgan McGuire uh, introduced a couple of years back. So this, what this is doing is that instead of doing this alpha test uh, in a predefined way, it's doing it randomly. For each pixel, just pick a random number, and based on this random number, you decide whether or not you discard the fragment. So you're doing this, this discard in software instead of doing this in uh, hardware. And you can even ex use it for alpha to coverage by outputting the proper alpha value based on what, what you decide. So, and and it, it, works, it works pretty well, actually. Uh, and a fairly, fairly simple idea, works like magic, it's, it's brilliant, I love it. So, the, the, the thing is that when I saw this work, I was like, wow, this is great, brilliant, but it's bothering me a little bit because it's, I'm not liking this noise too much. It's, it's a little too noisy for my liking. It's a, it seems a little too complicated for what it's trying to do. And I thought, you know what? This looks very much like dithering. Do you know dithering? The dithering is the concept of taking an image that is represented with a, a, a large 
palette of colors. So you have like all of the gray levels here and it's converted to an image that is using fewer gray levels. In, in this case, just, uh, just a couple. From a distance, it, they look exactly the same. But if you zoom in and, and look in detail, you, you'll see that this, this, one, this is just creating some dots. Uh, there's some holes and, and this is how you give the, the illusion, the perception of this image without actually using as many colors. So, dithering, used for printing a lot, for example. That, that's the concept. So I thought, hmm, why not just take our original alpha values and do dithering and figure out what is, if they're supposed to be zero or one. So you do this pre-process on all of your alpha values and you're done. Then you can just use alpha testing. Uh, as I call this alpha distribution, and you use alpha testing and you keep your beard. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not doing anything like there's no code, not, none whatsoever, using just uh, alpha testing supported by the GPU. You just modify the alpha values that you're using. And, and you can even turn on uh, alpha to coverage and you get you know, soft edges with alpha to coverage with alpha testing. You would sort of lose uh, some, some detail, even, even here, things will start looking transparent. Of course, the beard is, is totally gone in the distance. Uh, but with using alpha to coverage with alpha distribution, you, you solve all that problem. <laughs> yeah, he's balding as well, that's right. Uh, yeah, so the nice thing about the, this, this method that I, I, I presented a couple of years back, so hopefully uh, newer games will be using stuff like this, so we won't have uh, unexpected problems of this sort <laughs> right so that's the idea and this is where i'm going to end today's lecture i believe we covered everything that was related to transparency and blending and, and alpha even we talked about we even talked about refractions today so let's 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 end it here thank you all for joining another lecture for interactive computer graphics uh, and i'll see you all next time when we will be talking about volume rendering all right thanks guys